live in every hidden corner. Of the city of Venice is built on sand, in a lagoon between the sea and the land. First formed from river sediments, man has since created an ecosystem as fragile as Murano glass. Covering 550 square kilometers, it's one of the largest wetlands in the Mediterranean. Flamingos arrived at these Venetian waters quite recently. They crisscross the Mediterranean from North Africa to France's Camargue, to Sardinia, Tuscany, and now Venice. They feed on vegetable matter and small creatures they find in the mud of the lagoon. In the shadow of Venice, the lagoon is the northernmost flamingo habitat in Europe. They're here now, but in a few weeks, many will move off again to find richer pickings. Their takeoff may look clumsy, but once in the air, their flight is balletic and elegant. Before too long, they'll return to the safety of this lagoon, tucked between the sea, the city, and the Alps. The distant peaks helped form the lagoon. The mountain streams washed their rocky sediment towards the sea to make this habitat. Some of the lagoon's other birds are ready to leave. Dunlin, small waders, fed well in the rich mud. They rest on the wooden piles that support the whole of Venice. It's spring, time to head off to their northern breeding grounds. But the cormorants won't be lonely this summer. As the Dunlin fly away, other birds are flocking in. A bird's eye view reveals the full beauty of the lagoon. A labyrinth of uninhabited islands, intertwined canals and swampy sandbanks. These marshy wetlands are known as the Barene. To survive here, plants need to like salt water and flooding. Natural arteries called gebi meander through the brackish gardens, keeping the lagoon alive. The same waters flow through the city. The curving streams between the islands became the magical canals of Venice. This is the city of bridges. Visitors are mesmerized by the romance of the canals and the ancient architecture, and often miss the smaller, wilder sites around them. These mussels are true Venetian natives. And now, in spring, they're breeding. The males spawn into the water, and each female produces up to 10 million eggs. Most of the larvae are eaten by other inhabitants of the canals, but up to 10,000 young shellfish will survive. Just beyond the city, colonies of birds are breeding too. 
but a hazard of urban nesting is constant disturbance. Little terns will quickly fly back to their eggs and can miraculously find their own nest scrapes in the crowded colony. Their cousins, the sandwich terns, lay their eggs directly onto the sand. If the terns are disturbed, they have little time for incubating their eggs. The sand won't keep them warm for long. And left out in the open, they could be an easy target for predators. Foxes are the biggest predators hereabouts. But from the air, he's easy to spot. The birds make it known he's not welcome anywhere near their nests. Foxes would rather not get their feet wet. Hunting in these swampy areas is a frustrating business. Grand Leap disturbed another nesting bird. Now it's a question of following the scent. A welcome snack. Just beyond the sand dunes is the busy colony. In this mixed neighborhood, a pied avocet is brooding next to the sandwich terns. With nests so closely packed, there can be conflicting territorial claims with the common terns. stands his ground. The Grand Canal is the main waterway of Venice, dividing the city in two. It follows the course of the ancient river Brenta that runs from the Alps all the way into the lagoon. It offers a journey through architectural history starting in the 13th century. The banks of the Grand Canal have other surprises to offer, like Palazzo Malipiero's Rose Garden. Nestled between the buildings is a hidden paradise. Now owned by a modern-day countess, it has been restored to its full glory, and no detail has been left to chance. With the luxury of space in a city whose every square centimeter is exploited for maximum profit, it's also a sanctuary for many small animals. Every day, more than 50,000 tourists visit Venice. 
When the sun begins to set, the city's waterways empty. Venice belongs to the wild Venetians. Rats prefer to search for food in the cool night air. But they're not alone. Pine martins are hungry too, and rats are on their menu. Pine martins are welcome in the city as they're natural rat catchers. Agile with a keen sense of smell, they can find and follow any rat. But they're endangered too. Since the rat population boomed, ironically, many martins have been killed by rat poison. The rat won the day and the pine martin has to settle for dessert. Not such a sacrifice, as pine martins are omnivores. Both meat and veg are on their menu. And sometimes the vegetarian meal is an easier option. As the rat prepares to sleep, the city of Venice is beginning to wake up. The floating vegetable stalls are the first to move into action. Soon these silent waterways will become busy highways again. In the 18th century, over 8,000 gondolas navigated the Venice canals. Now, there are only about 400 left. Life in Venice may be moving with the times. But one thing never changes. It dictates the daily rhythms of the city and the lagoon. Twice a day, the tide rises and falls as seawater washes in and out of the lagoon. The water level changes by up to 60 centimeters. Smooth lakes disappear into swampy wetlands, only to return hours later. Retreating water levels reveal a surprise. Strange islands that look like complicated water mazes. In fact, they're fisheries at the edge of the lagoon, known as the Valle da Pesca. They've been worked by the same families for generations, using a simple but ingenious method. Nets are lowered into the locks that span the water channels. In the springtime, the locks bar the way to the young fish that stream into the lagoon to feed. The fishermen raise the nets and catch the small swarming fish in their thousands. It's easy to scoop them out, but these fish are not for eating. The fishermen place them on the other side of the bars and so trap them in the channels. 
Here, the spring fish are held under perfect conditions until they grow big enough to harvest. In the autumn, when the fish try to return to the sea, they're simply netted again. This time, they don't get away. Kingfishers have a more dramatic technique. They catch up to 20 fish a day, but need even more if they have nests with hungry growing chicks. It takes enormous skill, but also violence. A sharp blow to the head stuns the fish. And when it stops wiggling, the kingfisher can turn it round without fear of it escaping. The scales and fins of the fish need to be in line. Now it's ready to swallow. These shallow brackish waters at the edge of the lagoon are perfect hunting grounds for a kingfisher. But not every dive is successful. They'll snatch the odd insect in the air, but 95% of the kingfisher's catch must be made underwater. The cormorant has an easier life, as does the little egret. And some don't even get their feathers wet while hunting. There are plenty of fish in the lagoon, but they're not only found in the wetlands. These waters flow through the city too. And there are fish to be caught in the canals. Beneath the bustling jetties of the famous vaporettos or water taxis, wildlife flourishes. Even here, the little egret can fish where the water is deeper and turbulent. It's not easy to keep an eye on a moving target from a moving base. But persistence and patience pay off. fish travel into the lagoon because it's shallow, warm, and full of food. And in the autumn, they travel back out to the Adriatic Sea. The lagoon's fishermen understand the rhythms of the sea. But there was one phenomenon that remained a mystery for many years. When they cast their nets into the rich fishing grounds, they were torn to shreds. The fishermen believed that water spirits were grabbing their nets and named the area the Tenue, or Hold Fast. The Hold Fast was in fact a jagged reef, an unexpected and magical aquatic paradise. 
These unique natural rock formations are similar to coral reefs. They're home to all kinds of remarkable creatures. Serpent stars. Or marine annelids. This precious area is now protected. Fishing is forbidden. Diving strictly regulated. Even harvesting a shellfish delicacy like these canastrelli is banned. The city of Venice is lucky to have rich fishing grounds on its doorstep. The catch is seasonal, and in spring, the fish are small. But the fishermen will go out, as long as they can find a buyer. Only the weather can hold them back. City and wetlands are both at the mercy of the elements. A storm is heading towards the lagoon. When rain-bearing clouds build up against the southern face of the Alps, and when warm southerly winds whip up the sea, water is driven into the lagoon, flooding the city and engulfing the swampland. This extreme high tide is known as aqua alta and can be disastrous for ground-nesting birds. Thankfully, it's rare in the springtime. It strikes more often in the autumn. Storms can vanish as fast as they arrive, and the limpid sunlight that Venice is so famous for bathes the city again. In early summer, Venice teems with tourists. The Bridge of Sighs is a popular attraction, but few visitors realize that real Venetian life is happening just a short distance away. In the Giardini, a spacious and peaceful city park. There are some surprising residents. This prehistoric looking creature is an amorous green toad looking for a mate. After all, this is the city of romance. But for a toad, finding a partner in a city isn't always easy. Even a quiet park is full of danger and disruption. On the plus side, few of the park's visitors notice the presence of the toad, as it blends in so well with its surroundings. Another of the city's visitors is far more conspicuous. A stark contrast to the ancient buildings it comes to celebrate. And a danger to the fragile city. The toad at last finds a more secluded waterside spot. Soft light gentle fountains, the perfect place to mate. Venice is full of secret places hidden away from the main tourist routes. A traditional gondola repair shop nestles between the city's Zatere and Dorsoduro districts. Craftsmen repair the boats in the peace of the backwaters. The tranquility also attracts some exotic-looking animals.
Geckos are not native to Venice, but they've settled in well here. During the day, they'll sun themselves on warm stone. They're waiting for nightfall when the insects they eat will emerge. And in the golden light, birds that hunt geckos settle in for the night. Terns fly back to the safety of the colony, and others enjoy a final bath. Evening always brings a measure of peace to the city. The Grand Canal is now very quiet, a perfect time for the gecko. Geckos have evolved specially adapted feet that make them excellent climbers. Their toes are covered in millions of tiny branched flaps with incredible adhesive power, so they can grip and climb the smoothest surfaces, even glass. The city is empty now. The Grand Canal is deserted. The evening's activity has passed to Venice's bars and restaurants. By the time the tourists are safely tucked up in their beds, the city is like a ghost town. Almost. A rat has ventured out to make the most of any scraps left behind. He must take care not to become a meal himself. Owls on the prowl. One little owl is distracted by bright lights. There's nothing here but fruit. No good for the owl. This house call hasn't paid off. Time to make a swift exit. The lucky rat will make it home tonight. Cormorants bask in the morning sun. The terns start fishing early. The colony is now a hive of activity. The first chicks have hatched. Exhausted from the effort of breaking out of the egg. Around them, the colony has turned into a busy Italian restaurant as the adults noisily deliver their food. The chicks blend in well with the sand. Their cries for food are a new and insistent sound on the beach. Their calls are echoed by the adults who do nothing else but feed these demanding youngsters. It's hot and humid, and the lagoon is at its most beautiful. The hot summer months are the quietest for the fishermen. They take advantage of this time to mend their nets. They work and even sleep here with spectacular views of the surrounding wildlife.
About 8% of the lagoon's surface consists of islands. 20,000 people once lived on Torcello. Now, only the cathedral tower remains. Burano is known for its colorful buildings. San Francesco del Deserto is home to a Franciscan monastery. The island of Madonna del Monte is being swallowed by the lagoon. But the ruins of its monastery still stand proud. Enchanted places like this are an ideal refuge for wild animals. And the island's ancient monastery has some new inhabitants. The ruins are the perfect place for kestrels to nest. The hungry chicks are nearly as big as the adults and almost ready to fledge. Feeding this brood is a full-time job for both parents. Finally, curiosity gets the better of the young birds and they start to emerge from their hiding place. The first nervous explorer is soon followed by a sibling. They wait cautiously on a ledge, while one of the adults watches from afar. Their mother returns with food, and the young kestrels jostle to get to the front of the queue. The keenest and the loudest chick is fed first. Soon, the food parcels will stop. It's almost time for the young to leave the nest and fend for themselves. Not all of the lagoon is quite so peaceful. Venice's Lido, with its luxury hotels, is where the human bathers gather. But even here, you can find wild beauty and tranquility. In the Tenue, Venice's reef, one of nature's most delightful performances is in full swing. The squid's mating dance. The pair move together like synchronized swimmers as waves of rainbow colors pulse along their bodies. It's like an underwater version of the Venice Carnival. complete with face masks and disguises. Decorator crabs change their shape by attaching sponges and algae to their bodies. These bizarre disguises are excellent camouflage. The crabs creep past their neighbors and predators like living rocks from the seabed. The tern colony just beyond the city is flourishing. 
the chicks have fed well and are strong and healthy. The young birds are gathered in a crèche, with one or two adults looking after them all. Today's lesson is elementary flight. But the teacher's demonstration is over in a flash. The young birds flap their wings to exercise their growing flight muscles, but they're not ready to take to the air yet. Before long, they'll be flying as well as their parents. The young kestrels are also preparing for takeoff. They bravely take the plunge and launch themselves into the air. Dropping from a height makes their first flights easier. Once in the air, they're in their element and can glide and flap back to safety. These first flights mark the end of their parental care. Now they have to find their own territory. One of the kestrels has made its way to the nearby island of Burano. It's unlike the remote nest site, but it still has everything the kestrel needs. Just like the ruins, the brightly colored walls offer protection. These birds are welcome visitors, and the people here seem happy to have a kestrel watching over them. Autumn has arrived, and the wetlands once again change color. A plant called glasswort is responsible for this blush of pink. It flourishes in the swampy salt marshes. The first autumn mists mark the end of summer. The bright, humid days give way to cooler, grayer hues. The sea and the sky seem to merge into each other. Now in September, the sea is generally calm. But from the autumn equinox, there are high tides. And sometimes, Venice floods. For now, the water is still and shimmers like liquid mercury. When the temperature drops, the beaches are finally too cold for tourists. Animals better equipped to bear the chill reclaim them. A hungry fox sniffs along the shore looking for food. The fox has an excellent sense of smell and can see well in the twilight. It has picked up a strange scent. Something smells good to eat. But quite where this food is hidden is a mystery. Crabs have been crossing the beach leaving behind a number of trails, and the fox is very confused. Finally, it follows its nose and comes face to face with a crab. It's an unequal battle, but the crab has the advantage of armor and weapons.
this meal is more trouble than it's worth. There must be easier pickings. The crab, dazed but victorious, moves off to a more secluded place. More crabs congregate on the shoreline looking out to sea. But just across the water, the residents of Venice are having a less comfortable time. The waters of the lagoon are creeping into the city. The autumn tides are getting higher and water is seeping up through every available crack in the stones. The threat of aqua alta, the extreme high tide, is increasing every day. A combination of rising tides and the Scirocco winds cause this extreme event, and the rain just adds to it. Much of the city is only just above sea level, so there's very little to stop the floodwaters. This may look like a swimming pool, but it is in fact St. Mark's Square. Fortunately, this only lasts a few hours. Soft winter fog wraps the landscape like a blanket and brings the year to a close for Venice and its beautiful lagoon. The visitors have marveled at its sights, but many have missed the most fascinating wonders of all, the wild side of Venice. The city is empty now, but visiting season for the lagoon never ends. As one creature leaves, another takes its place.